Good day to everybody. It is August 6th, and today's daily devotions, we are still in the prophet Isaiah, chapters 42 through 44. Uh, so beginning in chapter 42, um, we have the first of four what are called servant songs. And um, the servant addressed here uh, in its original context uh, clearly seems to be the people of Israel um, who are a servant, but who also fail to be a servant. Christians have seen uh, Jesus as the fulfillment of these servant songs, and he ultimately becomes the servant that will bear witness uh, to the nations of of the God of Israel and uh, the redemption that God offers. And um, there's a fuller, for Christians, this is a fuller uh, fulfillment, a fuller explanation, a fuller sense of this. So um, in its original context, we have Israel, but Christians see Jesus as the faithful, as the faithful remnant. Um, Israel, uh, remnant theology is very important here. And, and the remnant is, is that, of course, the people go into exile in Babylon. What will happen eventually is a remnant of uh, the Jews who settle in Babylon return. Uh, most of the Jews do not return to uh, Jerusalem when the exile is over because uh, they've settled down and, and uh, they've got families and life is good there and they're prospering there. So it's, it's the remnant that returns. And then out of that remnant eventually comes Jesus, who is the remnant, the one remnant of the remnant who is faithful, who is the one who is, who is obedient to uh, the God of Israel and who embodies the presence of the God of Israel. <clears throat> so Christians are right to see this as a fuller sense fulfilled in Jesus. But in its original context, it refers to Israel. So um, starting in chapter 42, um, well, you also have uh, repetition in this section, so we're not going to be covering um, everything that is, is repeated. But you have um, in, in 42, uh, the prophet uh, turns again to this image of God's servant. Uh, and uh, uh, during much of recent scholarship in the 20th century, it was, uh, you know, again, these were separated as servant songs. Um, probably one of the things that are more helpful is to see these songs within the whole context of the passage and not simply lift it out. Okay. And that's what we're going to do. So, um, uh, so one of the things we, we learn here is that uh, these servant songs are meant to encourage Israel, but also to challenge Israel. The servant is supposed to be committed to the master as the master is committed to the servant. And these verses outline the nature of that commitment, uh, the role that God's servant is supposed to fulfill. The servant is to be the means by which God's uh, justice is proclaimed to the world. And proclaiming the justice of the God of Israel means making known in the world the way God is making decisions and is implementing in order to take the world to its proper God-desired destiny. Uh, Israel is to be a covenant people, and that is an embodiment they are to be the embodiment of what being in covenant with Israel looks like. Uh, and by being faithful to the Torah, by being faithful to the ways of God, it keeps the covenant and it thus is a light to the nations. But currently, remember this portion of Isaiah takes place probably in the Babylonian exile. Israel is in no state to fulfill its vocation. Uh, God's servant will not cry out or grow faint, we're told, in verses 2 to 4 of, of 42. But Israel in exile um, is doing exactly those things because they are in exile. Um, 
So here Israel is not actually named as God's servant. It is supposed to fulfill that role, but because of its current situation, it cannot. Um, so the servant vocation requires fulfillment, and this is where Christians uh, come in and see Jesus as the fulfillment of uh, these proclamations, that Jesus becomes uh, Israel, the, the servant of God that fulfills Israel's vocation. Um, <clears throat> starting in verse 10 of 42, you've got the image of transformation. Um, and this is a topic of praise. Uh, and here we've got something um, in, in the verses 10 through 17 that resemble a song of praise, a psalm. Uh, may remind us of some of the psalms we looked at. Uh, God has been silent and is holding back from action, but is now bringing the tumultuous events that will make Judah, the southern kingdom's restoration possible. So God has allowed judgment to take place on Israel, but now he will, he promises that he will work to make uh, the return from exile possible. Um Starting in uh, verses 42, 18 through 25, um, you have, again, this tension between calling Israel God's servant and describing the job description, if you will, of that servant that Israel just simply at the moment cannot fulfill. Now we get here in verse 42, uh, verse eight, uh, chapter 42, verse 18 and following, um, these, this tension becomes even more explicit. God's servant, uh, we're told, is deaf and blind. Um, and uh, the plan uh, was to commend God's teaching to the world through the servant, but people living in exile in Babylon or in the midst of devastation in, Jude, in Judah, uh, for those few who remain, simply cannot do that, um, especially when they don't comprehend what's going on, especially when they wonder what is happening. Why have you treated us this way, they ask God. And there is certainly an answer, and Yahweh replies. And so as we get into chapter 43, uh, we get a, a, uh, a message that we would think would be confrontational on the part of God, that why are you blaming me for what you have done that has led to this? But God really doesn't follow that confrontational logic that we would expect. Um, in Genesis, uh, we read, if we remember way back in Genesis, God uh, uh, told people, uh, his servants such as Abraham and Hagar and Isaac and Jacob, not to be afraid, afraid when they uh, face a difficult future. And here God gives the same bidding to Israel. Notice, which was also called at this point, Jacob. Uh, again, hearkening back to the patriarchs, to the last uh, of the great three patriarchs, uh, Jacob. So the present day Jacob uh, is in the same frightening position that uh, Israel had been in uh, even right from the beginning. Uh, God has not given up on this project that he's initiated with the people of Israel and he's not given up now. Um, at the Exodus, God gave up those claims on Egypt and uh, in order to have Israel, to call Israel out of Egypt. Um, and God intends now to bring his scattered people back to their land, that land that they received uh, on entering Canaan under the leadership of Joshua. Uh, beginning in 43a, the prophet develops uh, this point that God is with Israel <clears throat> and going to fulfill his promise. By uh, And here he highlights that with a challenge to the nations and their gods. These gods, we're told, have no one to testify to their uh, having spoken and even acted. <clears throat> but Israel's role uh, as God's servant is to testify, to witness to what God has done. And the deaf and blind witnesses will testify to what they have seen and heard. So there is coming a day when they will again testify. Uh, 
Starting in 4314, uh, we get the background uh, here is the situation of Judah under Babylonian domination. You've got its many people exiled in Babylon, uh, but only now is Babylon actually mentioned for the first time. Of course, the hearers of this message would have known that they were in exile in Babylon, so Babylon doesn't need to be mentioned. Uh, but up until this point, we have to assume that. But now Babylon is clearly mentioned uh, in stating that God intends to destroy Babylon. The prophet promises an act that will remind them again of the exodus. Um, but God tells the people to forget about the former events because what God intends to do now will eclipse the previous deeds. <clears throat> so there is a future to look forward to. And God is with the people. Um, in uh, so uh, starting in forty three twenty two, uh, you get more repetition of of what has been said. Uh, Yahweh, uh, you get uh, in forty three uh, twenty twenty two through twenty eight, the idea that God or that Israel wants to, in some sense, take God to court. Uh, for Israel's exile, that maybe God has acted unjustly, that or that God has been uh, neglectful. Um, but of course, <clears throat> God and God says, "Well, yes, I did do that, but I had every reason to do it. You were not faithful to the covenant. Uh, since the fall of Jerusalem, the people have not been calling on God to restore them." Uh, even though uh, they don't have sacrifices because the temple uh, has been destroyed, but they have not had to serve God in this way. And uh, in a sense, God says, you know, by your sins, you've tried to make me serve you. You've wanted to do things your way, but then sort of have me as your servant <clears throat> and calling on me when you need me. And that's not the way this covenant works. Um, so, uh, but God continues to, you know, say that he will, he will be with the people. <clears throat> All right. Um, chapter 44, Israel is reminded that they owe their allegiance to God, um, because God wants other people to come to know God and wants their allegiance. And that's not going to happen unless Israel does not bear witness. Um, you get in 44, uh, verse six, starting with verse six, uh, this very clear, clear, uh, declaration that only the God of Israel is God, only Yahweh is God. And this is, uh, this is a real clear statement about monotheism. That is the belief in the existence of only one God, because here, what, uh, is being said is that. Uh, Yahweh is not just one God among many who the Israelites should worship the only, this only God, but, um, the gods of Babylon, uh, they don't even exist there. So, so this is not just a worshiping one God in the midst of other gods. It's to say these gods are nothings. They don't exist. And only God, uh, uh, is the one true creator and re of the world and also its redeemer. So uh, it's a very clear statement about only one God. Now, when you get to uh, 44 verse nine, verses nine through 20, and this is this is the body, if you will, of chapter chapter 44, uh, it's the, this is the, uh, what we get is the most extensive argument against making images, God, images of God or the gods. Um, of course, through the centuries before the exile, we know that Israel was tempted to make images of their God in the way that other people had made images of their God and also uh, to make images of other God. We got the famous golden calf scene. Um, and uh, in Mesopotamia, in that land, the temptation would take new form as people were impressed by magnificent images of the Babylonian gods, no doubt, when they went to Babylon. Uh, the great images of the Babylonian deities. Now, 
it you could say that in theory no one would actually think that the images themselves were the deity babylonians knew their gods were much bigger than that um but uh the fact of the matter is sometimes in practice it worked out differently and so here the prophet isaiah uh the prophet the second isaiah prophet the second section uh, engages in some satire on the nonsensical uh, implications of making images. Um, and uh, <clears throat> here we also get uh, an affirmation for Israel to return uh, to God's ways. And the word here for return, shuv in the Hebrew, here is probably um, better translated in this context as repent. The people have turned from God uh, to other deities, and now they need to repent. They need to turn back to God. Um, but it's interesting that how, how God says this. It's not return to me and I will forgive you and redeem you, but return to me because I have forgiven and redeemed you. How interesting. The renewal of God's people and the relationship with God will not be complete until they return to God. But God's forgiving and returning is not contingent upon their return. Uh, God's relationship with Israel is not a contract. Covenant is not contractual. And so uh, it's the forgiving and the redeeming of Israel that is the motivation or should be the motivation for Israel returning. Just as our motivation uh, for holy living is our loving response to the God who first loved us. That's the way that this works throughout the Bible. All right, so the final verses uh, of chapter 44, uh, well, well, the initial verses depict God as Israel's creator, the world's creator, the one who is sovereign in, in political affairs and who thus fulfills the words uh, of prophets uh, such as Isaiah and frustrates the predictions of the false prophets. Um, and these prophetic words are uh, pertinent to the present situation. Uh, they promise, uh, as we have previously mentioned, a new version of the deliverance at the Red Sea. And then these claims are followed by quite a new statement. Uh, though Cyrus, uh, who is the king of Persia, who releases uh, Israel to go back to the promised land, though Cyrus work, um, is presupposed in this context only now is he named and uh shepherd as he is referred to here is a standard uh ancient near eastern description of a leader um so there's not it's there's nothing revolutionary here about uh, cyrus being described as god's agent god's shepherd uh, so we need to be careful about reading too much of, of that. God is going to use Cyrus for his purposes, even if Cyrus is unwitting in doing so. Uh, it's interesting that prophets usually refer to foreign rulers as agents of punishment. And uh, so when you get a foreign ruler such as Cyrus, who commissions uh, who allows exiles to return to Jerusalem and commissions uh, the rebuilding of Judah and of Jerusalem and the temple is significant. So this, this is a little bit different, but it is still that God is using Cyrus in the way he uses other rulers, even if they don't realize it. Um, and even if they think they're being used by their own deities, uh, that is not the case. It is God. Uh, who is uh, behind the scenes, pulling the strings, if you will. All right, that's the end for today. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you again for another wonderful gift of today. We know you are working and moving in our midst in this day and help us to be sensitive to the leading of your spirit in all of the uh, responsibilities and activities that we engage in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends. See you tomorrow.